What is it to have an enemy? By that I mean like, what does it look like for you or I to really have an enemy? What would it take for somebody to be an enemy? What would our response be to that enemy? For most of us, when we think of enemies, or at least for what I think of, when I think of an enemy, I always go to the idea of war. Two sides, maybe more sides, at war with one another. Enemies looking to destroy one another. And that is the reality of our world. Uh, But for the most of us, some of you, of course, were in the military, one of the branches of the military. But for most of us, we never directly experienced that kind of enemy. We never were at war with somebody. It's something that we experienced maybe through a person we know and love. We got to see the result of that where they come back with physical or mental ailments. We see it through the media. It makes impact in our life, but directly to have that kind of enemy, most people on this earth, or at least in the United States, have not had to experience. And so I thought for a long time, what would it look like? What does it look like for me to have an enemy? Have I even ever really truly had an enemy? And I spent actually a really long time thinking about this. And for a while, I'm like, well, uh, the best I can do is sports. I played sports growing up. I wrestled and played hockey. And in my mindset, which a lot of athletes take as a mindset, is when they they go and they compete against somebody, they make them an enemy in their mind. This is a, a person or a group of people who are standing in the way to what I want to achieve, which is victory. And so to hype ourselves up, to eke out an extra maybe 10% performance, we create this this image that they're an enemy to us and we'll destroy them. Whatever we can do within the confines of the the rules, including inflicting pain, we will do to to win. But it's not really a great great picture of an enemy because it's just the illusion. Because at the end of the contest, at the end of the match, the game, whatever it may be, when the final whistle blows, We had the moment to cool down. They're not real enemies. Most of the time, they're just strangers, somebody who we hadn't seen and probably will never see again. Or they're they're maybe even friends or acquaintances, someone who aren't enemies, but people we might love or even just like. And so I thought real hard, what do I ever, do I have an enemy? Have I ever had an enemy? And I'm not proud to say, but after I spent a lot of time processing this, I arrived at the conclusion I do have an enemy. I have enemies right now. As most of you, a lot of you know, I have a son, an adopted son, Dean, who we uh, adopted through foster care. This is, I have this young boy, my son, who I just love with my whole heart. And the reality for him is that uh, before he came to us, he experienced significant trauma. Significant trauma that left him with, with a lot of different issues in his life. Some of them that he's already overcome, uh, deformed lungs at birth, but some of them he's still healing through. He has trouble with speech. He has rage issues. Sometimes he goes into these fits where he just seems like he can't even get to the point of recognizing how to control himself. And I watched this young boy, this, this son that I love, struggle and hurt and in the, the deepest, darkest moments of that, it wells up me this anger, this, this hatred towards his birth parents. I watch what they have done to this kid I love in my response. And this is, I don't want this to be praised. This is sin in my life that I have been and am continuing to deal with. But I have this anger. I have created in my mind them as enemies because they have hurt something I deeply love. And I understand in those moments, right? I understand David writing the Psalms where he's like, God, where are you in this? Where is your righteous anger? Where is your fury, your wrath? I want them to experience times a thousand what they have done to my boy. I have made them an enemy. And I share all this I share this because for us to to really appreciate, to understand the gift that God has given us, we have to understand what it means to be an enemy and what we as as sinful people, what is in that nature, how we would respond to an enemy. And so today what we're doing, we're continuing our series lavish. We're looking at the gifts of God, these extravagant gifts that he has lavished upon us. And in particular today, the gift of love. 
And to, to really flesh out this gift, we're going to be looking at 1 John 4. So if you have your Bibles, please go ahead and open 1 John 4. We'll be starting in, in verse 7. And this is a passage within a letter that John wrote. And John, John is a guy who, who called himself the one whom Jesus loved. His entire identity was wrapped up in the fact that Jesus loved him. He, he no longer looked to the shame, the, the past mistakes of his life, all the failures, all the ways he viewed himself negatively or the others have viewed himself negatively. He had fully formed his identity around the fact that he was loved by Christ. And so this is a guy who was uniquely qualified really to, to flesh out this, this gift of love for us. And so this passage Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another. God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. John just seems like on a mission. He is going to, in these six short verses, he's going to jam the word love in there as often as possible. Again, this is something that was deeply personal to him. And he wanted the church that he was writing to, he wanted us to understand the depth of God's love, what it meant to, for God to love us, for us to receive that, and what it meant for how we were going to live. And so the first thing we see that John writes is that God is love. It's right there in the passage. He says it, verse seven, for love is from God. And just a verse later, directly, God is love. God is love. He wanted us to draw this direct line from the idea of love directly to God because God's, one of God's primary attributes, characteristics is love. It's not the only primary attribute, but it is one of the things, the defining characteristics of him. Love. It is how God operates in the world. Everything that he does flows out and through his love. So when we receive his blessings, it's an extension of his love. When he, when he walks beside us in the midst of our difficulties, in the valleys of life, that is an extension, a showing of his love. When he disciplines us, that is his love. When he, when he, he pours out his wrath, when he, when he judges righteously, those two are a showing of his love. I know that we often, that's a hard thing for us to comprehend, but all that God does, all that he is, is love. And not only that, but, but he defines love. Well, back in the Exodus series, during the summer, we were going through Exodus. In one of the weeks, we looked at that God is Yahweh. That is, he is unto which he is. And we talked about this idea that the characteristics of God, they don't define them so much as he defines them. So when we look at the idea of love, any definition of it that comes in conflict with God's definition has to lose. He defines love, he is love, and our understanding of love has to come through him. And the world has a lot of, a lot of ways that they define love. Just this general good feeling towards somebody, the, the idea that that love is infatuation or that it's like just that hippie version of love. Like, I'm just sending out good vibes into the world, bro. And all of these, they, they have a portion of love. They are a, 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 a distilled down, watered down illusion of love. We have taken the bar of love and we have lowered it, lowered it, and lowered it. We're at just a tiny, the tiny fragment of it resembles the love that God has, but it's nowhere near his love. It goes on, he goes on to say, and this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, propitiation in there, that's like a million dollar word, a big word that we really don't use anywhere else but in the Bible. And what it means is it is a sacrifice that appeases God's just judgment 
in righteous anger against us in our sin. That is what Jesus did on the cross. He was the sacrifice that appeased God's just anger and righteousness, righteous judgment, so that we ultimately could have eternal life. And the the perfect expression of love is found not anywhere else in the world, but through that act that God committed, where he sent his only son, he died on a cross for our sins. That is the perfect picture of love. It's not anything that the world wants it to define it as. In fact, the world's version of love, again, is just this, 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 this picture of something masquerading as love. Uh, last week, Jason, he talked about briefly the idea of biblical love. The word in here is agape, and it's this, this unconditional affection towards someone. In this case, God's affection towards us. It's a great definition of love. Unconditional uh, disposition towards us as sinners. It's not based on who we are, what we've done, and it's this, this, this way that God looks upon us. But the word affection there, um, I want to make sure we expand upon that because the idea of God's love, of true love, isn't just like this feeling or mindset towards somebody. It has to be carried out at some point in action. Paul David Tripp, he's an author, pastor, counselor, just an amazing source of knowledge about the Bible, defined this, this form of love as willing self-sacrifice. That yes, it is an unconditional affection toward us, but ultimately it is carried out, it is expressed through willing self-sacrifice. That's what Jesus did. That's how he showed us his love. It wasn't just that he loved us. He loved us to the point that he would sacrifice willingly himself, that he would go to the cross, that he would experience immense pain, that he would take our sins upon his shoulders, that the father would turn his back upon him and he would die for us for eternal life. The father, the father in an act of self-sacrifice forsakes his only son. I can't even imagine that. Anybody who has had kids to forsake your own children, like the, the, the depths to which God went for us, and the entire Trinity is included in us, that at this moment, for the first time, the only time in history, the perfect unity that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit have experienced doesn't exist. They are disunified because of of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. That is what love truly, truly looks like. Willing self-sacrifice. He does this not for, uh, for his own good, but for our good. He dies so that we can have eternal life. And there's nothing that he, that he gets in return from us. We can't give him any. He's the creator of the universe. What do we have to offer in exchange for it? Nothing. That is the difference between the world's version of love and God's version of love. The world's version of love ultimately is selfish, where God's version of love is selfless. I was listening to a podcast, I was, uh, and I wish I could remember it. I spent a lot of time trying to dig it up. One, uh, I think it would be great if people had the opportunity to listen, but also this isn't my idea. Uh, they deserve credit, and unfortunately, I couldn't, I couldn't track it down. But in it, he was talking about this idea that the world's love is selfish, that ultimately, when we talk about love from a worldly perspective, what we mean is we have self-love. Every form of love we have apart from God is simply love of self. When, and it's why we see so many relationships break down. Because when somebody stops offering something, stops making us feel good, stops giving us something that we desire, often fleshly desires, it severs relationship. It's what happens when we're parenting and we base our, our identity not around ourselves or around Christ, but we base our identity around how our children act because it says something to the world. And when we act out in anger towards them, what we are expressing is this self-love. They are now making us look bad. And God's version of love, what he has expressed to us, what he desires to build within us is self-sacrificial love. 
I want us to, though, uh, I want us to truly understand the depth of this love because even in that, which is an amazing, beautiful picture, even in that, it doesn't show the true depth of God's love. It goes so far beyond that. The depth of God's love is expressed in, in how we, our relation towards him while he showed us love. What I mean by that, I, I wanna look at this passage, Romans 5.10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. The idea that Paul's writing about in this is that we, we, when God, through Jesus' Christ, sacrificed on the cross, loved us, we weren't like in this okay relationship. It wasn't kind of just strained and severed, like uh, God doesn't really, he's not really great with us and we're not great with him, but things are okay-ish and now he's just gonna patch things up. We were completely opposed to him. It's why at the beginning, I painted the picture of what is an enemy because to truly understand the gift of God's love, we have to truly understand what it means to be an enemy of God. That God, when he loved us, he wasn't waiting for us to be reconciled to him. He wasn't waiting for us to take this step towards him and be like, well, now, now that you've come close enough to me, now I will love you back. He loved us when we were completely opposed to him. And I, 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 I got to be honest, I think I often struggle. What does that really mean? Why was I truly, truly an enemy to God? Because I, I know I sinned, I, but does that make me an enemy towards him? I think of when I, when I sin, when I hurt somebody I love, my wife, my kids, my friends, right? Even in those moments where I hurt them or they hurt me, like our, our relationship is hurt, but I wouldn't consider us enemies, because we don't understand the depth, I think, of what we have done to God. This idea of enemies, to be clear, comes from the root word, or the, the Greek word, ekthros, excuse me, ekthros. <laughs> and now this root word means to hate. That is how we viewed God. And, and to really understand it, we have to go all the way back to the beginning. We have to go back to the garden. We have to go back to God uh, in the creation story. So here we find God, he spent this time, he's created all heaven and earth, all the cosmos, everything. He's created our planet, he's created the animals upon it. And he gets to the end and he decides that he is now going to create his favored creation. He takes and he takes man and woman and puts them on the earth and they alone, Adam and Eve and, and, and every human after that are created in God's image, that means each one of us, we receive a part of him that is, is a part of us. We carry forth his creativity, his love, his wisdom, his intelligence, all things, all right? We are not like him, uh, but we carry forth parts of him that he has in, imbued in us. Like that's how much he loved us. That's how much he cared for us. He made us in his image. He does that with no other part of his creation. And then he takes us, he takes us and he, he places us Adam and Eve, in the garden, in Eden, in paradise. Now, I don't know what your version of paradise is. I'm sure we all have something different. Maybe it's, maybe it's this beach, this perfectly combed beach. And maybe it's Hawaii. You're sitting on the beach. You've got a coconut with a little umbrella in it, and the waves are just rolling in. The sun's beating down, but it's not too hot on you. It's just perfect day vacation, or maybe it's like up in the mountains where there's just the snow and you're in a log cabin with a roaring fire and drinking coffee and reading a book and there's fresh powder out, or, or maybe it's just on a boat out in the river fishing with the peace and quiet. I don't know what your version of paradise is, but whatever it is, it doesn't compare to this. This version of paradise is really unimaginable. It's perfect. Everything about it is perfect. The temperature is perfect. The food, the provision that God has for us, perfect. We don't even have to work for it. We just, we are just given it. Uh, Adam and Eve are just given it. They can eat of it. it it's unblemished. And, 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 and not only that, right, there's, there's nothing bad going on. There's no sin. There's no anger or hate or shame or guilt, any of that. It's perfection. We don't know exactly what it looked like, but I do know this, it was so good you didn't even have to wear clothes there. 
And then he takes, he takes us and he sets Adam and Eve there and it's really a representation of all humanity. And while they're there, what do they get to do? They walk with God, face to face with God. They have perfect relationship with their creator and they're enveloped in his love. Remember, God is love. So they just get to experience this feeling of love. And then God, he's like, that's not enough. I wanna give humanity more. And so he says, here, you now have purpose. You get to go forth. One of these purposes, be fruitful and multiply. You get to have a role in continuing out, carrying out God's creation throughout the generations. And the way you're gonna do it is gonna be awesome. And not only that, but you have purpose in the sense that he says, you have dominion over all of my creation, the land and the animals within it. You get to have authority in it so that for your benefit, you get to really be the gardeners of God. This perfect, perfect gift. And then he says, oh, by the way, there's one thing though. There's one thing, that tree over there, don't eat of it because it won't be good for you. Everything else, everything perfect else that he's given us, you can partake in except for that one tree. What do Adam and Eve do? What, 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 what in essence do we do? Say, mm, you know, God, this is really, really good, but I think there's something better that can be found on the other side of that tree. Something better because I don't know why, but um, maybe God, you're just not good enough. You didn't like, there's something beyond this perfection or maybe you're holding out on us. Uh, you're not willing to give us everything that you could possibly give us. Uh, but ultimately what it is, it's us saying we could do better than you, God. And then we go forward through all the history of humanity and we continue to spit in God's face. We continue day after day, year after year to stomp on that gift in his face. We go forward and say, God, the presence with you, we're not interested. In fact, in fact, we don't even want to acknowledge your existence anymore. And the commands you give, they're clearly not for our benefit. They simply exist for you to exert power and authority over them. We don't want that. We can come up with better commands and, and laws. And, and, and the purpose you give us, yeah, it's great. Like we can be fruitful. We can have dominion over the earth, but we're going to use those for our greed and our ego and our power. And when we want more of them or we want somebody else to have less of them, We'll wage war. We'll commit genocide. We will hurt one another. We took the perfect gift. We took the perfect gift of God and we have continued day in and day out to destroy it, to remind him the, the rejection that we have, the hate that we have for him. Imagine if somebody gave you the perfect, imagine if this Christmas you, you came up with the perfect gift for the people you loved, the perfect gift. You spent all year planning it, you saved up, you researched, you knew exactly what your spouse, your kids, your friends, whatever it may be, you, you knew exactly what they wanted, what they needed, and you gave it to them on Christmas and they opened the gift and they looked at you and just said, this is garbage, I don't want this, and threw it on the ground in front of you. And then they reminded you day in and day out that you weren't enough, that it wasn't good enough, that you could have done, they could have done better. How would you respond to that? How would you respond to that, that re complete and total rejection? I don't think anybody would blame you. I, I certainly wouldn't if you decided, you know what, I'm not gonna be a part of this. I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna, I'm gonna separate myself from them completely. I'm, I'm done with them. And what did God do? He didn't pick up his ball and go home. He didn't say, yeah, you're saying I'm leaving you for all eternity. He said, I'm going to die for those people. Where they rejected me, where they hated me, where they made me enemies, I'm going to die for them. That is the depth of love that God has for us. That while we were his enemies, he loved us. He loved us to the point the father would send his only son to sacrifice himself on the cross for us. And this love that we receive, this gift that we receive, this gift of love that we, that we just have lavished upon us, it is, it is for our benefit, but it is, not, it is not for us to hoard. 
The idea was for God, when he gave us this love, to take it, to, to enjoy it, to feel his presence because of it, but then to extend it. The love of God was to be extended. It's, it's all throughout the entirety of the New Testament. It's what John says as he's talking about love. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If God loved us, if he had unconditional affection that resulted in willing self-sacrifice, and he does have that for us, we also ought to love one another. Now, specifically who he's talking about here is he's writing to the church. He's saying, church, as you have been loved, now you are to love each other. And I want to make that really real this moment. I want you to take just a moment right now and I want you to look around to your left and to your right. That is who John, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, ultimately God is calling us to love one another, to be willing to go to the depth of willing self-sacrifice. That is the call that he has given us. And what, what, what John says and if, if you've received that love from God, the, the very least what we can do is turn in love the people that he loved and died for. And he actually goes even a step further. He says, that as we jump forward to verse 19 through 21, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. And this command meant we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. They're just really, really strong, harsh words. But what I love is how he starts this passage, how really he started every part of this discussion of love. We love because he first loved us. When we talk about extending love, it's not something we muster up. It's not something we force out of us. It is a result of the overflow, the abundance of love we receive from God. This love that we are called to extend to one another doesn't come from anything within us on our own. It solely comes from experiencing it from God, from the Holy Spirit who works within us, bringing it forth. It, it is not... It is not loving each other in, in, the, in the pursuit of earning something from God. It is loving each other out of the love that we have received. And he's pretty forceful about it. He says, he says <clears throat> if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. That we are, are called un, unquestionably to love one another. It's what Jesus would talk about. It's what Paul would talk about. It's really all of the major writers of the New Testament, Jesus himself, that talked about loving one another. He even sums it up at the bottom. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. It's, it's the commandments from Jesus that Jesus would often talk about. Before he left his disciples, he told them that you are to love one another and that the world would know me because of that that part of our mission, our purpose as followers of Christ is to love one another so that the unsaved can see that love, can be, uh, th th they can experience a picture of who God is. And ultimately, hopefully, that they would accept that love themselves. It's what Jesus would often talk about, his love God, yes, first, but also love your brother, that they were two commandments. They were two separate things. They're not the same thing, loving God and loving one another, but they are extrinsically tied together. Basically, if you will say you love God, but you can't love his redeemed, loved creation, that doesn't, that doesn't work. Loving God immediately is to outflow into loving his people. And beyond that, actually, we were called to even something higher than that. It's not in this passage. But what we saw is Jesus would talk about that is often it goes beyond not just, not just the church, but to all humanity. We were to love everyone. When he's approached, and there's multiple occasions of this, he would be approached and, and questioned, what is the greatest commandment? Or how do I obtain, obtain eternal life? And that specific question that he answers pertains to the old law. That, that this isn't how we attain life. But 
the principle of it is the same. Well, sum up everything. Well, love God and love others as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And there's a specific instance of it where, he's, where he says, well, who, the guy asks, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story of the good Samaritan. And in it, there's a man who is beat close to death and a Samaritan, a, a, a person who is despised in the Jewish community, is their absolute enemy, an abomination to them comes and loves this man and, and, and cares for him to the point where he, he comes back to health. And the idea behind it was that our neighbor, who we are called to love, isn't just the people that we, are, uh, that we like, isn't just the people within our community, but really anyone at any point that we come in contact to. That's who we are called to love. Our community, strangers, our enemies. God loved us while we were his enemies, and we are called to extend that love to even the people we would call our enemies. Now, I want to end today. I want to end today uh, just sharing, sharing uh, just this short uh, sample of lyrics from a song, one of my favorite songs. It's by uh, this group called King's Kaleidoscope. It's the, the song is How Deep. And the beginning part and the ending of the song really just sums up this picture of the depth of love God has for us. It says, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. That is what God's love has done in you. He has taken you. He has sacrificed himself for you. He has made you from a wretch to a treasure. I'm going to go ahead and release to the campuses. I love you guys and have a great day. Thanks for sticking around uh, for our transformational moment today. We just want you to really wrestle with some questions, uh, very much almost exactly the same as last week's questions. How have you experienced God's love? Like, Where in your life are you or have you experienced his love? And yes, if you're a follower of Christ, that would look like ultimately him dying on the cross for you. But uh, he allows us to experience, to feel his love in different parts of our life where he cares for us, where he walks for us, where he uses other followers of Christ uh, to love on us. Where have you experienced God's love? And the second question is, where do you need to extend love? Where do you need to extend love? Where are you not extending love that really you are called to extend love? Where have you made an enemy out of somebody who, who God who God would call us to love. How can you do that? Where can you do that in your life? Now, thank you guys. Have a great day.